Rhetoric of Openness. I know what you're thinking. Good title. It is a good title. I'm very proud of it. Let's see if the talk's any good. Um, <clears throat> here it is again, but uh, much prettier. So here's, here's kind of the area that I, I'm trying to sort of frame, and I, I think it's important to say at the start that it, it's useful to make a distinction between um, the, the, the kind of mechanism, the kind of industry of academia on the one hand, and the uh, and the whole area of teaching and learning on the other. Now, I'm not saying that you don't learn things if you're kind of being or operating as an academic, as a researcher, obviously. And I'm not saying that teaching and learning doesn't involve academia. But some of what I'm talk going to talk about will uh, apply to um, kind of, well, generally, I'm talking about teaching and learning. And some of it applies to academia. But I think it's useful to separate those two things out at the start. And I think for many discussions, it's useful to separate those two things out. Um, so openness, and why did I call it the rhetoric of openness? Well, I think here's what I think has happened, is the internet, which you may have heard of, uh, was uh, sort of, it's obviously specifically designed with the idea of maximum sharing and maximum openness. I mean, that was the drive behind designing it. And I believe it was kind of put together by a, a kind of odd combination of uh, the American military academics and effectively hippies as well. So it, 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 let's not forget how peculiar the web is as a cultural phenomenon. I know what, anyway. And um, uh, it's a, definitely a kind of grassroots uh, thing, the internet, but also this idea of openness and where it's come from. So what's happened is I think this concept of openness, which we haven't really dissected in detail yet, has come up from the grassroots up through the culture of the web and the increasing, uh, the, the sort of increasing availability of the web, it becoming culturally normalized. And what it's done is it's it's come up to a certain level where it's suddenly hit institutions and institutions are having to consider their response or the way that they may be engaged with this concept of openness. Now, the reason that I called it the rhetoric of openness is because a few years ago, I went to uh, the Alt-C conference. And is anybody from the OU in the, uh, in the audience or in the room? Just wave or you'll have to say something in the text chat box, I think. It doesn't matter if you are or you aren't, really. But it was just interesting to me because yeah, that's true. It was interesting to me because the then new VC for the OU um, gave a keynote, and he was talking about a lot of the things that the o, that the OU do, that Open University do, in terms of openness. And um, obviously, they've got Open Learn, and they've got all sorts of other kind of activities that are genuinely very open. Uh, but there was something about the way that he was talking. There was something about uh, what he was saying that didn't quite sit right with me at the time. And it, it was only a few days later that I realized that what was happening there was that a number of the kind of themes or almost like the ideology that myself and a number of my colleagues, some of the people in the, in the room here, had been talking about in terms of this sort of form of, of openness on the web. He was, he'd taken that and he'd reflected it back to us, but using a, from a kind of institutional standpoint. And the language was slightly different and the angle was slightly different. So it struck me that what had happened was that openness as a concept had uh, moved up from the grassroots of the internet and it kind of hit the top of the institutions and now it was being reflected back down again. And we see that kind of thing happening at Oxford. We see it happening at a lot of different institutions where institutions will talk about openness, um, but it has a particular flavor. OK, so what we're looking at here is traditional institutions trying to either engage with, appropriate, or perhaps in some cases misunderstand a kind of culture of the web. Um, but it's not quite as simple as um, this, this quote actually comes from a paper that's to do with the US government um, making things more open, more transparent. It's actually to do with transparency. And, and this, the, these notions of, tra this, these notions of trans institutional transparency, political transparency, are closely linked with these ideas of openness as well. And I think what's being said here is, is, is important, is that you can't just simply make stuff available online and that solves the whole problem. Because people will, 
assuming you've even defined the problem, because uh, people will uh, pick stuff up and appropriate it to their own ends, okay? whereas I think that perhaps uh, some kinds uh, institutions will make things open, in inverted commas, uh, with an assumption as to how they're going to be appropriated. But what we can see here is that just simply saying, we're going to do everything openly, doesn't necessarily um, roll through all of the different processes. It doesn't, it's, not, it, it's just one step in, in a much more complicated or complex area. Okay? And here's one of the areas that from the point of view of, say, uh, higher education that I think is really interesting. I mean, we, we've, uh, we're just um, writing our final report for a GISC study that we've done uh, looking at the impact of open educational resources in terms of their use, okay? Um, and you could put it that way, Francis, yes. Uh, and you you can you could almost say that your comment there, Francis, is a uh, reflection of my slide. I think I think in some ways that's sort of what I'm trying to say. Um, is but you can say it much more in much more precise terms, whereas I have to dodge around it slightly. So uh, I kind of lost my thread there. You see, see, this is the problem with interactivity. <laughs> So where was I? Yes, we're doing the OER impact. <laughs> no, no, carry on talking, carry on talking. <laughs> Please don't stop talking. Otherwise, it'll just be me in this tiny room with a very small air conditioning vent behind me. Anyway, doing this OER impact study, and we're going around talking to people about um, their institution's uh, reuse of OER. OK, so not production, but reuse. And when we talk to people who are in strategic positions, fairly senior positions in different HE institutions, more often than not, we find that their, e that their entry into the kind of openness space uh, was actually, c actually comes out of the marketing department, or at least partially comes out of the marketing department. Uh, and so we have. So we have this uh, tension between the fact that the marketing department is uh, what's behind the drive to sharing and openness, but the rhetoric tends to be around social good. So if you ask uh, a, a VC or anybody reasonably senior at, at, at uh, a university, why are you making all this uh, material open? Why are you putting stuff online for free? They will say, well, we think it's important uh, that, that the university has a position in society. We think it's our responsibility to share so that lifelong learners and learners in general can take advantage of the blah, blah, blah. And, you know, Know, that's that's the responsibility of of, of, of uh, higher education within culture as a whole, uh, and and yet there's a, a large focus on how many hits they've had. Um, most of the uh, a lot of institutions are using iTunes U, which is is not necessarily a bad thing, but is obviously a very um, slick package, a very slick way of getting out there and being open. Uh, so. I think that there's that there's a kind of tension there that we that we've seen taking place, and and I, I, you know I think we could we probably all agree that institutions see openness as an opportunity for visibility, uh, but and I'm not saying that that social good can't come from that, but I think there's a tension in that. And as I mentioned, uh, iTunes U is, is where a lot of that's taking place. It's interesting talking to people about their reuse of OER. And I think that iTunes U um, has done a lot to kind of open the space up. But there, there might be some concerns in the sense that uh, teaching practitioners see material in iTunes U and might well imagine that that is the level of slickness that you need to work at, the level of media production to make your material um, open and there's this, there's, there's this tension here between um, the, the kind of pedagogical relevance or the pedagogical um, potential of material that you might make open and the sort of media slickness of it. Now I have to say that having interviewed a number of students for our OER impact study, it was it was split. Well, it, and also the the tutors kind of trying to second guess what their students thought. It was also split where there, some of them were saying, yeah, it's in, it's important to me that if we're consuming if we're looking at open content that's come from elsewhere or even within our own institution, it's important to us that it looks reasonable, that it has reasonable production values. Otherwise, we think it's just not professional. Whereas there were other people who were saying, I don't really care what it looks like um, as long as it teaches me what I need to uh, uh, know. What are we talking about? 
outlier. Okay, so here's some quotes. I, I think this is interesting because um, I know that um, I think Helen Beaton has used this, the phrase that openness is the um, the opposite of is the enemy of knowability. So one of the problems institutionally is that if you make your stuff genuinely open and you don't have to provide any details before you get at the stuff, you don't know who's using it and you don't know what's on what basis. So up until this point, we've had an awful lot of just hits. So we can say out of Oxford, oh, we've, we've had eight, nine, ten million downloads, but we don't actually necessarily know how the stuff's being appropriated. So uh, again, there's a kind of challenge there in the sense of what is the value of this stuff to, to the institution. And I went to a talk that was given by a guy from Coventry University who they'd um, they put online this video that was to do with something to do with car business or car manufacturing. It was fairly niche, but it had 51,000 downloads because it must have hit a piece of curriculum that other people were doing. And his response was, um, we don't really know who's using this, but how can 51,000 hits be a bad thing? And it's fair to say that that's where we're at institutionally in terms of making our stuff open if we're talking about open content. I'm going to move on to other forms of openness in a minute. Uh, so there's a, there's, there's a question there as to what do all these hits mean? What is the value of them? Okay, and um, th somebody's mentioning the Khan Academy. You know, there are lots of examples of, the, of these sort of massive forms of engagement, and this comes out of the Open Spires project, which is uh, run by Pete Robinson out of the Learning Technologies Group here at Oxford. And you can see how this is a head teacher saying, "We picked up these um, podcasts, and I'm using them in my school as a piece of teaching material." Now that how can, that's got to be a good thing, hasn't it? So here's a good, there's a good example of a kind of more sort of conversational example of where some of this stuff is being used. Um, this one I like because this one is basically saying that uh, uh, the HE sector being open with its content is good because it stops old people having to watch Countdown. We can only assume that that's a social good in of itself. Um, but what's interesting about that is that that person there specifically said. Um, I don't want them to be fancied up. I just want the straight material. I don't want media slickness. And as I say, it would appear it's not clear where people stand on that. I mean, obviously, different people in different contexts want different things. But there's a question as to where, as to how precious we should be. Precious, we should precious. We should be about. Um, making sure that our materials that we make open out of universities are of a certain level of media production. It's questionable whether the, whether the effort involved is, is of value. Now, at this point in the talk, I, I wanted to kind of show a little video that comes out of Nottingham University, which is one of their periodic table videos. It's a really good example of how well this kind of format can work. They're little sort of three to five minute videos, and each one of them is about an element of the periodic table. Uh, you can go and have a look and download them. They're a really great example. They're kind of personable, but they go through. Uh, there's one on manganese that was very popular for a while. I've watched it uh, twice, and I now know everything about manganese. Okay, so we know that those bits of material work from the point of view of, of, of uh, learning, and people people like them. They're popular. Um, but it's a question of how slick they should be. Those ones out of Nottingham are very, very nicely put together, I've got to say. They, 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 they're quite friendly. They don't, they're not slick in the way that a television advert would be slick. They're very friendly. In the manganese one, the, the guy in the lab spends quite a lot of time tapping the bottle to get the manganese out, and it cuts back to him, and he realizes there's a bit of paper wedged in the top. But they've kept that in, so they put a human face on it. And I, so I, um, I think that it's worth taking a look around some of this material to get to get a sense of it. We know that students really in, enjoy it because they find it engaging. But here's okay, here's the big deal, I think, is I've been talking about open content. There are lots of different kinds of opens uh, uh, on I use the period of, uh, I use the periodic ta tales for home ed with my 14 year old. Well, there you go, Lou. Well done on the on the schooling there. But obviously, you'll be well aware of how friendly and how useful they are. Uh, manganese has five uh, electrons, which means that it has rich chemistry. Yeah, I haven't watched that video for a month, and I don't know anything about chemistry. Well, that went in mainly because the guy in the video has got really scary hair. Um, thanks, Alan. Um, so. 
there are lots of different sort of flavors of openness out on the web. And I think we've done that classic thing whereby, you know, we, we use the term open. It's a tricky term. It's a big term. If you have a conversation or a discussion about it, everybody's actually assuming that it means slightly different things. So we think about different types of openness. We've got open content. We've got the open source software music, uh, movement. Uh, we've got um, open research. Um, we've got open data. Um, there's an interesting, I mean, I think open data is a great example of, of some of the tensions or some of the challenges that come out of this area whereby, for example, Oxford University, a lot of its energy meters are hopefully going to be made open. There are a lot, there's a big government push for these things. But what we do with that open data hasn't necessarily been figured out. It's, uh, you know, why would anybody want to look at it on, on what basis, in what context, will it actually change their behavior, okay? Um, so there's a difference between open content and open practice. And I, I think this, this comes out for me very strongly in the open courseware stuff, which I expect we all know about. That's been going for 10 years at MIT, putting, on, uh, putting out the content of entire courses online. But if you watch their um, promotional uh, video, then they specifically say in the middle of their promotional video for OpenCourseWare, uh, of course, we're giving you all this content for free because we're lovely, but that's not the authentic experience. They actually use the term authentic, I think. They say, if, you know, the authentic experience is coming to MIT and uh, uh, getting yourself a degree uh, and paying us lots of money. I mean, they don't say that directly, but they make the point that the content is not what's authentic about engaging with MIT educationally. They're basically saying, here it is, go for your life. If this works for you, that's great. We put it out there. But if you want the real deal, you need to turn up. And I think it's the case that institutions are, are very careful. At, I think they have a good understanding, even if it's implicit, of what they consider to be the authentic drawing a box. It's like, uh, they, is what they consider to be the authentic educational experience, okay? Or there's this vague shared understanding of what it is. And I think one of the reasons why institutions are happy to share content is because they, they then say, oh, the authentic experience is actually the teaching and learning and you need to come here and you need to get accredited. Which is interesting because I think historically, uh, universities were all too happy to say, uh, we hold the content, and if you come study with us, then you get access to that content. And over a relatively short period of time, um, that's shifted enormously, hasn't it? And so institutions have to reposition themselves uh, relative to the fact that they don't particularly have, that, that they're, they're not necessarily sole gatekeepers for certain types of content. Now, the fact of the matter is that when you, if you go to university to study, then you do get your institutional log on and you might be able to get into the libraries and into journals and periodicals. So it would be uh, remiss to imagine that you don't get access to content by going to a university. But nevertheless, this split between um, uh, open content and open practice is, is an interesting one because teaching is practice, okay? And we haven't particularly made that open. We've held back on that. What's going on in here? I can't read the text fast enough. Yes, there's... Um, there, it, it, it's difficult to know who owns this stuff. That's a whole different... Uh, Kettle of fish. Now, on the other hand of, uh, on the other side of it, if we think about open courseware at one end of the spectrum, where they're just saying, "Go for your life," but we're not teaching you. You need to know that we're not teaching you. We're holding that back. At the other end is this OER university idea, and I'm not sure how far they've got with this idea. I'm not sure if anybody in in the room knows uh, any more about this, um, but it's. You know, they effectively, it seems like a very dangerous thing to say to me, but they're effectively saying, hey, it, all the content's free, we can gather it all together, and therefore we can knock out a degree, they don't say knock out, therefore we can deliver an, a probably an online distance degree for uh, cheap, for a lot less money. Um, and I'm not sure how they're going to do that, because it strikes me that teaching is quite expensive. Um, obviously, they can hypothetically gather together an awful lot of OER materials to, to, to put together a course, or they could even take entire modules, you know, this idea of sort of big OER they could take and put them on. But nevertheless, that, uh, 
you know, the, the just the open content, how's that going to work? So we've got two ends of the spectrum there, the kind of, here's the content, go for your life, but we're not teaching you. At the other end of the spectrum, we can gather together the content for free, so therefore we can put something on for cheap. And here's, here's something that's really important in the whole area, and it gets wrangled about um, endlessly. And um, I was at a talk that was being given by a woman from Pearson, who obviously a huge sort of publishing company, and they have their own kind of virtual learning environment. And she was trying to make the point um, that these uh, open source uh, virtual learning environments like, like Moodle, for example, aren't actually free because you need to have somebody, you need a clever person to pick them up, install them, manage them, etc., administer them. And so uh, open source isn't free. And at that point, somebody in the audience who then went, to give on an ex went, to, went on to give an excellent talk about um, open source um, software, um, he pointed out that the open in open source is not open in the sense of free of charge economically. It's open in the sense that you are free to do what you like with it. And that is a huge distinction which, again, under the banner of openness, I don't think that, that at an institutional level we're, we're necessarily dealing with. I think institutions are comfortable with the idea of, here's some brilliant material we've made. Aren't we lovely giving it to you? But then I think that there'll be, even institutions that have made things openly licensed might be quite surprised if that stuff's picked up, turned around, put a different logo on and represented. Hypothetically, with some of the CC licenses that are out there on material, you could pick up a video out of iTunes U, it depends on the exact license, slice the logos out of it, put your own logos in and use it to run your own institution, like those OER university people. Now, I'm going to be very interested to see what, what, what happens at that point, you know, whatever the technically the legal situation is. So this is where, obviously, this is where this becomes important, is because the Creative Commons license uh, shifts us from the idea of economically free to free to, free to a certain extent to do what you would like with it, with the material. And I think it's fair to say, that, um, well, put it this way, okay, I'm, I'm working, braced, uh, stay with me for this, because I'm, I'm thinking about this at the moment, I'm working on this idea of a kind of iceberg model, okay, as part of our um, reporting on uh, OER impact and OER reuse, where we've been going around, as I say, talking to people in quite a few institutions, we've been talking to students and tutors and strategists. And it strikes me that uh, reuse um, of open material is a little bit like a, a, an, an iceberg, with the bit that's out of the water being being kind of reuse in or production in the name of the institution. Okay, so there's a relatively small amount of reuse or consumption of this kind of material, this kind of open material, which is done very visibly. That's the tip of the iceberg, and that's where Creative Commons becomes very important, because you can't be producing stuff or grabbing stuff off the web and putting it into a course structure and then putting that back out there or selling it or uh, it, using it with students in a kind of in the name of the institution without the licensing being in a reasonably good state. Nevertheless, the majority of reuse takes place below the waterline, what I'm sort of calling below the institutional waterline. And that, at that point, that's within individual te teaching practitioners and the students themselves, okay, the learners. And um, that's not visible outside of the institution. And people, we know that people pick up stuff uh, from, uh, from Google, from uh, OER repositories from iTunes U and use it all the time. Okay, so I think my thoughts when it comes to this idea of the difference between free at the point of use and free to do what you like with it is that the CC that the Creative Commons licensing it becomes very important when you're above the institutional waterline. Below the institutional waterline is not that important because. You know, some people would say, you can't repurpose or mash about something that hasn't got a CC license. Well, you can. It's just illegal. It's actually quite easy to do it. And so people do. And generally speaking, if you ask people, 
about these issues, they either don't know about them or gently disregard them. I think we've got to be realistic about that. So in terms of the idea of, of, of reuse, um, do any institutions sign up to the concept of a water line? I don't know. It's probably like a pimsoul line. Uh, let's not stretch this. Me let's not stretch the metaphor too far. So the fact of the matter is, is that we know that a lot of people are reusing stuff. We know that the openness works from that point of view. It's just not that. It's not most of the reuse takes place in non-visible areas. Okay. So now. Here's a kind of slightly divisive, I called it information black market, okay? And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of moving into a slightly different territory here. But in actual fact, you could call it a learning black market, is what I realized. Um, we, I'm um, involved in another study, which it, it is based, it has using the visitor residence idea as a framework. And we're going around and talking to, um, interviewing students at different educational levels. Okay? And so far in our pilot, we've interviewed students who are late stage secondary school and early stage HE. And we call that the kind of transitional um, educational stage because we're interested to know whether people's engagement with the sort of digital environment, whether it shifts uh, over time or whether it whether they students develop techniques which they take with them quite a long way through their educational career. Okay, historically we've always kind of had this quite hard split between um, say secondary level education and HE in this country. But for a lot of people, that's only a few weeks. Okay, so I, I just thought it'd be really useful to figure out what the students' methodologies for engaging with this openness on the web were before they came to university. Because as we know, historically, there's just been a mild panic about incoming students. So we've, we've been doing that. This idea kind of comes out of early data from that. Okay, so. Yeah, um, I mean, there's a discussion going on about the ridiculousness of copyright laws and how it's too difficult to get permission and et cetera, et cetera. It is one of those areas where if you ask enough questions, then it just seems to get more and more complex. I mean, it, it shouldn't. Um, and, and that's, I think that's one of the reasons why um, it's only at, um, at the at high level in the institution that, that the kind of copyright's cleared properly. And it is very, um, yeah, copyright is a complex. Copyright is a complex and annoying. That's a good sentence. I like that. But I think we can go with James on that. But as I say, and I think this is the point: copyright or no, it doesn't stop anybody using stuff that's on the web. Okay. One of the interesting things about that as well is, and probably the most annoying aspect of that is where people have put materials online clearly because they want them to be reused, but they haven't thought about licensing, and so hypothetically you can't reuse them. So I think there should be some sort of a case for you know, reasonable reuse, fair reuse. It just seems to make sense to me. And we know that this practice has been going on for years. It's one of those classic cases where uh, digital technology just kind of brings it into sharper contrast. Um, so, the learning black market. OK, let's get back onto that. We, we've been talking to these students in uh, late stage secondary school, early stage age, and we've been talking to them. It's this project that's happening in both the US and in the UK. OK, so we're partnering with the OCLC on this uh, and JISC. And um, uh, what we found is that um, a lot, there are a lot of great learning resources out there let's say Wikipedia, for example, um, that students use all the time, but they're kind of not allowed to admit that they use it. Right? So here's what happens. Here's, here's an interesting uh, thing that came out of the US. They're really harsh in the US on this. They, they, that appears to be a cultural st split. So the interviewer says, if you use Wikipedia, do they actually fail you? They don't fail you, but you get ridiculed in front of everyone for sourcing Wikipedia. So basically what they're saying is if you use Wikipedia, you get pointed at and laughed at, okay? which you know, I think personally that's an excellent digital literacy policy. And we should try to embed that across our institutions. We should, uh, you know, Wikipedia, YouTube, any Anything that was discussed on Facebook, if you if you raise that in a classroom environment, then the official policy should be that you get pointed at and laughed at. Um, 
Exactly, they don't cite Wikipedia, but they do learn from Wikipedia, okay? So here's an interesting conundrum which is beginning to bother me more and more, which is whether Wikipedia is a good quality source or not, the reason that students are told to be careful about it is because it's uh, certainly in America, is because it's difficult to cite, okay, because you haven't got a name to cite. So there's that split between teaching and learning and academia. The quality of these materials could be fantastic in academically or from a teaching and learning point of view, but because it's not easy to cite, it can't be included, okay? And I think what we've got is a situation whereby the, the mechanisms of academia are, are who'd have thought it, who'd have thunk it, a little bit behind what's going on on the internet, okay? Now, having said that, we um, did a little check of things like the APA, you know, the citation standards, and a number of them are, you know, they have blog posts in there, there's some with podcasts, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but nevertheless, so hypothetically, if you use APA, you can formally cite a podcast. So it's kind of creeping up, the students are still very nervous about it. But what it means is, and I think this is something that's happening that's, that's coming out of the uh, secondary school kind of area, the, the compulsory education area, is that students are being told to just be generally a bit suspicious of everything on the internet, including things like, except for the things that are, that are told to go through di to, to directly by teachers. Now, this is, but this, that, that's a very generic statement. Obviously, it's patchy what students are being told, but they're nervous about it. And so what we're generating here is either an information or a learning black market, whereby the, the students are using all these resources in their own time and learning very effectively from them, in my opinion, but then they're not able to use them directly in uh, assessments or in America, even in class discussions. And again, we could say, OK, there's been this split between teaching and learning and, and the mechanisms of academia for years, but I think that the openness and the sudden abundance of content is, again, putting that in sharper and sharper contrast. And it's something that we need to get to grips with because there's a whole kind of era of, I don't know, is there 15, 20 years worth of students that have gone through this little hole whereby there, were, there was all this stuff available to them, but they weren't necessarily told how to make best use of it. In some cases, they are. It's getting better. I'm not, I'm, it's not doom and gloom, this, but it just intrigues me. So, yeah, obviously, students shouldn't just use Wikipedia. I'm just reacting to the, to the text window from, from James there. Um, James K. Gloucestershire College, in fact, which is, he's got a longer name than I thought he did have originally. Um, it's... They shouldn't just use Wikipedia, uh, but I've spoken to some secondary school students who appear to have got most of the way through secondary school never having picked up a textbook. We even ask a question, have you been uh, asked to go to a particular source of information by your teacher but chosen to go elsewhere? And quite a few of the students say, yeah, we were told to read this book, but it's kind of long, so I googled it and found something much better. That's happening now all over the place, okay? so. There's a new, uh, let, let's put it in sort of more positive terms, there's a new information seeking cycle, if you like. There's a new, there, are, there are new opportunities and ways to learn and as educational institutions we haven't quite got to grips with what those are and we haven't been honest about recognizing them. I think that's somewhere where we're at, okay. She didn't want to use a library as books there would confuse them. I don't know. Have I got a problem with that? Does it matter? I mean, a book's made out of a flattened tree, but you can scan a book in and put it on the internet. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to come to that later. Um, we're so tied to these genres as if, like, as if a, 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 a um, mode of delivery was somehow indicative of a, of a type of information. Um, w there was one student, and then I'll plow on, who actually said, um, well, I use books as a primary resource, but the internet as a secondary resource, as if the whole of the internet was a secondary resource. And I think they'd been taught that, which was get the real stuff from books, and if you need to fill it in around the edges or double check stuff, why not look at the, web, at the internet, okay? okay? I'll come on to that at the end. I'm getting quite animated about that. Oh, <laughs> so here's, we, we ask students what their methodology for engaging with digital information environment is for their studies. This is the answer. 
get used to it. <laughs> <laughs> because let's face it, we all do this. Uh, it was just funny. I mean, obviously, we, do, we don't pose the question in that way. But we say, hey, what kind of strategies have you got for learning when it comes to technology? Mm, strategies? Google? Anyway, the answer's not always like this. Uh, the next slide actually comes from another student. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So <coughs> let me just go back to that one. I just type it into Google and see what comes up. I simply just type it into Google and just see what comes up. So yeah, I think there might have been some conclusion, collusion there. We took them down. We put it into Turnitin. We decided they'd plagiarized, and they were both struck off. Um, so they, they could have been friends, to be fair. It was from the same school. But that's what we're dealing with here. And, and we, know, we know that that's what happens. So you know, in terms of um, openness, uh, it's, I think it's very important for higher education um, institutions or educational institutions to be open certainly with their material because on the flip side of this out of our OER impact study is while people aren't particularly certainly students and to a lesser extent um, uh, you know tutors teaching practitioners while they're not particularly concerned about licensing they do trust material that comes from universities so there's a trust on quality and relevance the last thing anybody wants to do is to waste their time reading a bunch of stuff that turns out to be you know anomalous and obviously that's a bigger risk for students who are still learning that subject area so they really value it when their tutors say here's a bunch of links that I can tell you are actually pretty decent they'll absolutely jump on that because you know there's a big risk uh, with Google. There was one isolated example of a student who had used internet sites, um, quoted, uh, used bits, referred, now wait a minute, learned from internet sites and mentioned it in essays. The internet sites had plagiarized from a book, so he got, he got told off for plagiarizing. It's a risky business for students. And I don't think we're really doing such a great job of teaching them what, how to go about dealing with those kind of things. Now, Another um, another interesting uh, thing, because uh, what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the flip side of openness. Okay, So we've got openness from an institutional point of view. I've gone through some of those tensions. I'm looking at openness from the point of view of it being appropriated by students and, and tutors. We asked uh, students, um, do you, uh, if you had a magic wand, at which point they suppress a smirk, if you had a magic wand, would you, what would you be your ideal way of finding out stuff for your learning and a lot of them come back with this kind of quote which I won't read out because you can read but the point is here that a lot and this is just me musing okay so that should come there should be a little warning light that comes up um, but it would be on for most of the talk so let's not go there um, one of the things that I think is happening here if you read this quote is effectively they're saying what would be most useful for me is if exactly what I need came up straight away and I didn't have to do annoying things like evaluate sources and decide if they're relevant, okay? Or, to put it another term, research. So, I think we're beginning to get to the point whereby students see the process of research as actually being a failure of search engine optimization. Do you see what I mean? And I don't think they're necessarily being told, well, they might be being told otherwise, I'm not too sure, but it just sort of intrigued me that if, you, if ultimately what they're asking for is something that is a perfect search engine that means they don't have to do any work. Okay. Here's another example of that. This is the only problem is just knowing what information to use and why. Now, these are secondary school students, so it, it's kind of fair that, that this would be something that they'd be nervous about and something that they'd find difficult because they're used to a very controlled environment and the internet isn't like that. But again, what they want is they want to be guided to the right stuff, okay? which is something we can help with. And this is the bit of the talk that I want to go through reasonably quickly because some of, some of you uh, will uh, know about this kind of area inside out. Um, I, I, I think what's obviously what's happened is that we confused uh, the idea of owning technology with the idea of being expert with it and we've kind of lost a sort of generation of, of, of students to that. So, and there's another example of that. 
Okay. I, I, I'd warrant that a lot of, well, maybe this isn't the right room to, uh, to, to say this, but I'd say that quite a lot of people own phones that they don't know how to use to their maximum potential for learning, for example. Um, and th here we have, we've got the net generation, millennials, screen ages, generation, whatever it might be. Um, yeah, we've got to be honest. Most of us made these kind of assumptions that 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 there'd be an increasing uh, adeptitude. Is that even a word? Adept. Anyway, uh, with technology, um, and that would just sort of gradually increase. And in some ways, it's increased. But obviously, odd. You know, what hasn't increased is students' ability to learn without some help. Okay, which is kind of the job of educational institutions to get involved with. And I'm not quite sure why we haven't dug in um, almost more aggressively in this area. Um, perhaps people in this room have. And we know that this comes from this kind of assumption about the digital native and the digital immigrant, which is not something that I'm going to go into, because I'm going to assume that you all know what the digital native and the digital, digital immigrant is. But it's that generational thing. And it's, it, it's intriguing, because when you consider the things that are leveled against the Google generation, they're things like uh, you know, short attention span, uh, uh, more in, you know, not interested in reading books, um, uh, uh, you know, casual, broken use of the English language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, that's just a classic generational gap opening up, isn't it? Because you could have leveled that at the MTV generation. You could have leveled it at them in James Dean, Rebel Without a Cause. And so I think that what's happened is that we've, we've been in a situation whereby we, 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 we've tried to characterize a generation gap, which perhaps doesn't exist with technology in the way that we thought it would. And that's all I'm going to say about that. OK, so at this point, I'm sorry I haven't yet. Yeah, we had to learn how to use it. Most of us, I suspect, learned it through trial and error. Those who fail to learn how to learn, failed to learn. That's, a, that's quite a sentence at the end there, James. But I, I, I know what you're saying. Um, and yes, interesting you should mention that, uh, um, Alan. Um, yeah, he has. And to be fair, that's one of the reasons why I don't talk about this too much now is because Prensky redefined it and he, he called it intergenerational knowledge and digital wisdom. It, although, if you read the digital wisdom paper, it gets pretty wacky towards the end. Um, yes, digital wisdom. So I, I, was, ahead of the, I was ahead of the text for once. Um, here, here's what we're going to do. We're going to play a game uh, that I, normally I do in, uh, and we're going to do it very quickly, that normally I do in a room. Let's see if it works in here. Right. So probably most of the people in this room are digital immigrants, um, but some of you will be digital natives. So the ones of you, I'm being ironic, OK? <laughs> I don't know. I suppose you can see what I look like. There's no ironic face. I'm going to put this squiggly line on my thing. There we go. So. Some of you will know the answers to these questions, because if you're a digital native, clearly you know everything uh, to do with technology, and some of you don't. OK. Oh, um, that's, what it, that's what digital uh, native and digital re residents came to be known. And it was kind of unfair on Prensky. OK, what's that? Type it in. No. <laughs> Honer. I believe you mean Homer. Yes, well done. James, you're just that little bit too old, aren't you? You're, you must be a digital immigrant. OK, what's this? These come from an actual book called, called Texting Book. It's a Queen song. It is a Queen song. Well done. I'm enjoying this. What's that? This one's a little bit more difficult. As I say, these have come from a book, and I can cite them. So they must be real and true. Lady Gaga, that's not bad, actually. Me and I write. It could be me. I'll tell you what it is. It's impossible. It's supposed to be a nonplussed fisherman carrying a stinky octopus to mark it on his head. That's the stink wave at the top there. Um, next one. This is just trying to wake people up because I've been talking too much. <laughs> yeah, thanks, James. <laughs> Anybody got an idea what that, that, what that might mean in text speak? Clearly, this is nonsense. If you, yeah, not bad, Pat. Shall I tell you what it is? 
yeah, oh, Max is getting there. Yeah, Francis is somewhere. Yeah, everybody's getting there. I think it's uh, I no I you no oh oh man I've forgotten it now. I think it's I know what I mean, and I think you do too. Is what that is. It's obviously used a lot in text speak. The kids are doing it all the time, man. Uh, and what about this one? This is the last one, and then I promise I'll talk about something substantive. <laughs> yeah, right, I made that one up. That's just nonsense. Uh, I just like... <laughs> I just like putting that in front of people, because some people come up with the craziest answers. Um, could be a man with a tie winking with... Uh, anyway, let's move on. So, obviously, uh, in terms... Uh, you know, I proposed this idea of the digital visitor and the digital resident, and James put a link to my blog post or video on that. And this is the thing that's framing the background of this study that we're doing. Because what we don't want to do is imagine that, uh, and I'm not going to discuss this now because we've only got 10 minutes, but you can you can have a look at that if you, if you don't know what that is. But essentially it's saying that some people partially live online and other people just visit and just use online as a tool. So it's the difference between people who conceive of, 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 of uh, the web as a set of tools or as a series of places, or both. Okay, it's a continuum. Uh, the, the continuum. But what I want to do is come back to openness now, and I think that this is this is this is kind of where my thoughts on the subject of openness actually um, sort of come all the way around. And uh, I don't just talk about tensions, but I talk about some. I want to talk about some of the some of the ways I think we could approach this. Okay. So we've got broadcast or conversation. So I'm going to use an example from me, slightly anecdotal, but it just makes the point. So you can go to Clout, which is this service that will give you a number to tell you what your influence, influence, whatever that means, on Twitter is. And a while back in February, this is no longer the case, I had the same amount of clout as the University of Oxford, and therefore was as influential as the entire institution that I represented, which can't possibly be the case. So why was it that I had the same clout score? Well, the reason was because the University of Oxford account, perfectly reasonably, it just tweets when there's an interesting research story or news article, okay? whereas I tend to operate in a much more conversational way. So if we look at it on this kind of grid, you can see what I mean. So part of the reason that I'm in Twitter is because I enjoy that kind of discourse. I see it as a place for discourse. But the University of Oxford account, as I say quite reasonably, sees it more as a kind of institutional broadcast method. So this and this is where it, you know the the pedal hits the rubber, hits the metal, hits the road, or what have you. This is where it really starts to become challenging. Because one thing to be open and to have this rhetoric of openness when uh, we're talking about, for example, putting content out there, whether it's licensed or not, it's another thing to be open in that conversational sense, okay? And it, it, it's interesting to me in terms of open content and open practice that teaching to my mind, should be a form of discourse or conversation. And that's the bit that institutions tend to hold back, because that's the bit that they, that they consider is, is the authentic experience. And you know, everybody's got to pay the gas bill. I'm not imagining that we should be doing everything for free. I'm just trying to kind of break the area down into, into more manageable uh, chunks. Um, I've asked a number of people at institutions this question, which I think is a, is a really useful question, which is, what do you think your students think they are paying for? And it's quite a difficult thing to answer. There's a lot of nervousness about it. Now, in an environment where there's, where there's an abundance of content, as our friend uh, Martin Weller might say, then I think they are looking for a conversation. Then they don't want this kind of broadcast approach. I think that they, if you like, um, are more interested in contact than content, or to put it another way, contact is becoming the, mo the more valuable resource. One reason for it is because it's quite often time delinea delineated, and therefore it's, it's, it's valuable in, in the sense that it's scarce. But also in the context of open content, contact starts to become more and more important. And I think, as I've said before, this becomes increasingly important uh, when uh, What's going on there? Is Alan just having a bit of typing trouble? He's getting quite angry, isn't he? Um, and 
you know, as I said before, I think that this is really important, especially for us where it comes to technology, because increasingly face-to-face -face courses, larger proportions of them are taking place online. I've spoke to people at institutions where they say, we have to put 20% of all our courses in the virtual learning environment. Nobody knows what that means. Uh, we, and people talk about contact hours, but in some places, the metric for contact hours doesn't include technology, only includes being in the same room. Okay? So if you spent all night emailing backwards and forwards with your student, that wouldn't be contact. Uh, again, uh, we, we've noticed out of our visitor and residence project that a lot of people who we describe as residents go into Facebook to talk to people to find information out. Okay, So their favorite source of information is actually a person. And that person could be face-to-face -face or it could be via technology. And, so, and until we start getting to grips with all these different ways that openness can take place and the areas that the students really value and, and really get the most out of, then we're going to, you know, it's going to be difficult. I, I don't think institution, I don't think institutional strategic mechanisms have really kind of found a way of talking or measuring or discussing this stuff. And here's a kind of defining example of that is, you know, if going back to that magic wand question, uh, often the answer to that, you know, what would be your ideal sort of learning thing, often the answer is, you know, Google but perfect. But sometimes it's actually, I, I just want one of my teachers to just be able to appear. I could just wave a wand and they'd appear and I'd ask them a question. And interestingly, I think, and we're still, you know, we're in uh, it's early days in the project. I think that those people that I describe as a resident quite often answer this question. So the reason they go to the web is, to, as I say, to find people to learn stuff from. Now, equate that to, you know, going to the library for a book. It's a much more kind of subtle or complex area, I think. Um, so I'm going to finish up. Um, I mean, that, this is, this, that, that's just really to emphasize that point, is that when we did our Hefke study of online distance learning, um, you know, one of the things that came out was that, that those that were good at online distance learning as institutions understood that the students really wanted contact. It becomes very important when you're uh, working online distance. Um, so I'm going to skip over that one. I'm just going to go to the, I, I, I like to finish a talk with a picture of a woman in a bikini. I think that's um, important. Um, so here's my point really, is, is digital is not a genre. And I'm sure that most of you guys in this room have a good understanding of this, but m an awful lot of people don't. And they think of, uh, they think of say, the web as a certain thing. So a, a, a certain type, so rather than a mode of distribution, it's a genre of information or a type of engagement. So they might think that, you know, all, all conversations on the internet are banal, okay? They might think that all information is like Wikipedia and, 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 and can't be trusted. Okay? But nevertheless, we know that there are journal papers on, uh, there are respected peer-reviewed journal, journal papers out there online. There are, picture, there are animations of kittens dancing to uh, Rage Against the Machine as well. You know, all of life is in the internet, and yet we are still at a point in time where some people think of it as a genre. And I, I think that what we need to be talking about, and this is something that I really like, is the difference between uh, ingenuity and innovation. Okay, so I think we need to stop talking about innovation, and this is something that's been discussed out there, uh, in the sense that uh, what happens is when most people let's, when most people approach the the web to incorporate it in say their teaching and learning or when they're looking to the web in terms of openness, what they're actually doing is they're thinking I'm going to use the new stuff to do new things. Okay, they 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 assume that a use of technology has to be innovative. So what they're what they're not really talking about it they're not really talking about innovation. They're talking about new for the sake of new, and I think we need to be focusing on uh, ingenuity, the ingenious use of technologies or, or that are already there that might not be new. And, and it's something that perhaps I've spoken about before. And out of the Hefke study, there was one quote that really stayed with me, which came from some people that were doing a lot of online distance learning, which was the technology is vital but not central. So the technology is absolutely vital, 
but we need to be ingenious with it, not necessarily innovative. We can be innovative, but that might not be the best way to focus. Um, so I've kind of started with openness, gone through from an institutional point of view, hopefully gone through from a student point of view, talked about a few other things, got a little bit animated in places. There's still 50 people in the room, so I assume it can't have been, <laughs> can't have been too bad. Um, yeah, exactly. Technology gets boring. Technology gets transparent. We've won. Technology is everywhere. Let's stop talking about it from that point of view. Let's get ingenious with it instead of evangelizing. Okay. Yeah, we might. Um, Thanks very much for I'm that. I'm going to get off mic. mic okay. I don't know what happened um, now. Are you okay to take a few I questions? I kind of run to time it's there. To you. I was going to say, um, we can do some thanks very questions much for listening and thanks for chatting time. away as well. We it's just great to know that people are still uh, awake, unless, of course, you can type while you're asleep. I can be on the mic. <laughs> yeah, I've got... I, I sure. <laughs> well, I'm not sure if it is. I think if I was professional, I would have stopped before the end for questions, but there you are. No, I appreciate that people perhaps, that perhaps this is people's lunchtime, and if you okay, need to go, well, then, then you have your mic to say then, but if you want to raise your hand, we can turn the mic on again and ask questions whether that's questions through the If you want uh, text to, or, or just carry on with the text chat, whatever suits you. And as Dave says, if we need to go, by all means do so. Okay, we've got a question from Pat. Let's turn, oh, all the mics are on. Away you go, Pat. Do you know how to use this? You just need to click the mic button at the bottom left of the screen. Or has he now gone? Nothing's there. Hands down again. Okay, I'll stop rambling and let you ask questions if you want to, however you want to ask them. I should probably direct you to the text box because I think Pat's asked it in there, Dave. Okay. Uh, do you think that the problem is waiting for institutions? Why not act as individuals? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not even sure what an institution is when you come to think of it in 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 that kind of way. Um, yeah, no, there's there's definitely. I think there's nothing I haven't talked about that we can't tackle in our own individual practice. I think perhaps the challenge is where. That we we now have, as I said at the start, these kind of grassroots ideas have, have hit the top of institutions are being reflected back down in a slightly different way. So we we now have um, institutions saying, oh, we're all open content, open practice, or what, what, whatever they might be saying, um, and they might be saying that on behalf of you as a member of that institution. So I think on the one hand, there's a lot we can do in our own practice or in our own area. But we just have to be a little bit careful to, to keep an eye on uh, what the, if you like, what the rhetoric of openness or what the rhetoric is out of our institution on these things. Um, because we could be setting false expectations, we could be setting correct expectations, but we need to admit that we are, you know, tied to our institutions conceptually like that. Um, do you think lecturers are anxious about using technology because the institution does not appear to support it? I think that people are anxious about using technology because they're not sure whether it's going to be a massive hassle and take them an enormous amount of time and that perhaps it's easier to stick to what you know. I mean, generally speaking, I think it's one of the difficulties that we have in this whole area in terms of embedding because in my experience, a lot of really successful, innovative uses of technology are by people who are prepared to stay up till midnight every night, making sure it's all working and chit-chatting and sorting it all out. And so they don't, you know, they're prepared to go beyond the boundaries of their job. So I think the challenge for us is to um, find is to find fair ways of, of embedding technology in such a way that can actually be incorporated into practice pragmatically. And I'm not talking about simply swapping out bits of existing practice for with technology. So that classic kind of thing of let's take out all the chalkboards and put smart boards in and then use them exactly the same as chalkboards, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But I think it like I say, if we're ingenious, then we can find uh, sort of lateral ways of, of, of supporting people take this stuff up. But we have to be honest about the fact that most people want to go home and not look at computers all evening, or some of them anyway. <laughs> <laughs>